Hello and welcome back to the Dark Souls King of the Casuals Challenge, the series where I'll be doing a run with every weapon in the game. For today's episode, we're going with the Eido. Yes, I know I mispronounced it in my last video, but I'm learning. So let's get into the rules. 1. Any direct damage I deal must come from the Eido, meaning no other weapons and no damage dealing consumables except to kill Gwynvir to unlock Gwendolyn. Enemies doing friendly fire and falling off ledges is allowed. 2. Kill all bosses, including the DLC. 3. No summons. 4. No breaking the game. While some exploits such as the Catacomb skip will be used throughout the series to speed up level traversal, I'm not allowed to abuse any major glitches like move swaps, wrong warps, or item duplication. 5. No online features. While the Dark Souls servers were down at the time, leaving me with no choice in the matter, because I use cheat software to give myself the necessary items and stats to actually do these runs, it wouldn't be right to interact with other players. Aside from that, everything is fair game. So let's take a look at the Eido. It's a katana type weapon that can be obtained in a normal playthrough as a pickup in Blight Town. It sports reasonable base damage and when fully upgraded an impressive A rank scaling and dexterity. As a katana, the Eido can also inflict bleed with each strike, meaning it acts as an effective DPS increase on enemies that aren't resistant to bleed. It follows the standard upgrade path. The Eido requires 14 strength and 20 dexterity to use, so starting as the deprived class, I boost myself up to soul level 15 to get 20 dexterity, allowing me to two hand it. I will need to get a few levels in strength if I want to one-hand it. So with the Eido along with the necessary stats, I make my way through the Undead Asylum. Now let's see that plunging attack. Yes, that makes me happy. With half the Asylum Demon's health chunked and a solid weapon in hand, it's absolutely trivial to finish the thing off. A quick crow ride later and we've made our way to Firelink Shrine. But before I move on, if you find yourself enjoying the video, please consider liking and subscribing because it really does help. And if you're into video essays, check out the main channel linked below. I've also got a supercut of just the boss kills for this run if you're into that sort of thing. Let's get back to the run. So what's the game plan? Well, the Eido is known for being a solid weapon all around, so I'm not really expecting any difficulties, which is especially true considering its fast attack speed, solid DPS, and decent range. Also, since it only scales with dexterity, it's a no-brainer as far as what my build will be. First, I'll level up strength to 14 to open up one-handed options. Then, I'll primarily go with dexterity until I hit the soft cap of 40. After that, I'll just dump levels into vitality and endurance as I see fit. I'll be going with the standard plus 15 upgrade path. So let's get started. I start out by doing all the early due diligence stuff that I'm typically too lazy for. I grab all the nearby soul and utility pickups and then head down to New Londo both to grab the Firekeeper soul and with the aid of the Master Key, make my way through the Valley of Drakes to grab the Grass Crest shield for that sweet stamina regen. One thing I want to do with this series is to continually optimize my runs as I go to do the things I need to do to get through the game a bit more efficiently. After all, over the course of nearly 130 runs, any time saved will seriously add up in the long run. Grabbing all these useful things right off the bat rather than waiting until later like I would normally do is the first step in that process. So with my little collectathon out of the way, it's time to make my way to the first real boss of the game. The trip through Undead Burg is entirely uneventful. The Eido's simple moveset means that despite not using katanas much, I don't feel the need to get any practice in. So I just go straight through, only making one quick detour to politely convince the Undead Merchant to give up his residence key. The Taurus Demon himself is incredibly easy as you might expect. I'm getting better at remembering to toggle off the FPS boosting mod that breaks plunging attacks so I'm able to get that satisfying chunk off and with the assistance of a nice bleed proc, the rest of the fight goes incredibly smoothly. I also make sure to actually kill the Crystal Lizard hiding in a barrel nearby. Can you believe that I actually didn't even know it was there until recently where I watched a video where somebody mentioned it? Moving on, I unlock the shortcut, level up enough to one-hand the Eido, make my way over the Bernie Bridge, which is another thing I didn't know how to do until recently, and sadly miss the quick path into Undead Parish, forcing me to take the long route. In any case, a quick pit stop with Andre to upgrade Eido a bit, and Firelink to upgrade my Estus with a shiny new Firekeeper Soul puts me in a great position for the Bell Gargoyles. The fight itself was a joke. The Eido has very high DPS for this point in the game, and the fast attack speed makes for a lot of maneuverability in the fight, which is great for chopping off the first dude's tail. And due to that high DPS, I was able to finish off the first before the second was able to really start honing in on me. And one on one, these guys are nothing. First bell rung. I go back to Andre to spend my newfound souls to bring Iado to plus 5 and head down to face the Capra Demon. I don't really struggle with lower undead Berg anymore, but this time is even easier than usual. I've got a fast weapon that one hits everything here. That makes things trivial. On to Goat Boy himself. So I'm going to tell you a little something about how I normally play the game. I typically prefer to go with high damage, slower weapons in my playthroughs because a lot of the harder, more fun bosses in the game have relatively small punishment windows. 
so if I'm only going to get one hit in anyway, might as well go for the biggest bonk. But when I face Goaty McGoatface, the difficulty of that fight is entirely due to the enclosed space and those fucking dogs. So I like to bring a faster weapon as a switch to kill the dogs and then bring out the bonk for the actual boss. But the Iaido is a fast weapon and it one hits the dogs. So two quick roll attacks kills the doggos dead and the rest of the fight is easy as can be. Moving on to the depths, I decide to implement a minor skip to save time for this and future runs. So by jumping off this ledge, making sure to toggle off the FPS boost, you can skip right past all those annoying hollows. Not a huge time save, but every little bit helps. So I quickly kill the channeler. I quickly kill the channeler. And from there, it's a straight shot to... Fucking hell, let's just fight the gaping asshole already. If you've played this game, you know how this fight goes. Easy as anything, but this boy's thicker than a snicker, so it takes forever. The trip through Blight Town went much smoother than last time. For whatever reason, the AI gods decided to take pity on me, and it was pretty much a straight shot through. I did make a quick detour to do some of that brilliant Dark Souls platforming in order to grab a second Eido. We won't be using it for quite a while, but I'd rather not backtrack later on. Aside from that, I made it through without dying even once. I am very proud of myself. Time for Spider Waifu. Now here's where we first see what I'd say is the biggest weakness of the Katana weapon class. So the Iaido's base damage is on the lower side. Not bad by any stretch, but not super high. Scaling will eventually compensate for some of that, but ultimately this weapon is primarily all about its fast attack speed and its ability to inflict bleed. Unfortunately, that means that while it shines against enemies with low resistances that can bleed, and we will see this later on, it does fall off a bit against enemies with high resistances that can't bleed. And unfortunately, Quilag has the highest slash resistance of any boss so far, and either she's immune to bleed or her resistance to bleed is so high that it doesn't matter, because I did not get a single proc on her. So that meant that this fight was a bit of a slog, even with the Lightning Pine resin from Undead Berg that I actually remembered to use this time. Fortunately, she's not particularly difficult as long as you watch for the Lava Puke, so despite the low damage, I'm able to make it through. But I do think it's high time that I nut up and start using the red tear stone ring in my runs. Like I said earlier, any time saved will seriously add up over the course of the series. So with that, I ring the second bell and go past the fake wall to visit Best Girl. Now, I may have accidentally answered no to the maggot man so he wouldn't move aside from me, so I did kind of have to kill him. But in the end, he slandered me by saying I was a danger to the real spider waifu. And whatever you want to say about me, nobody fucks with Best Girl while I'm around. So he's a dick and I no longer feel bad about the whole murder thing. From there, a quick suicide run, two quick suicide runs for the Firekeeper soul, and after taking the fast way out, it's back to Undead Parish to... Oh, fuck. I forgot to kill Lawtrek after the Bell Gargoyles, and he killed the Firekeeper while I was out killing Spider Waifu. Since I am not leaving Firelink Shrine unlit for the rest of the game, I guess that's something else I gotta take care of. Okay, now that I feel like an idiot, we can now move on to the Undead Parish to prep for Jigsaw's Fuck Shack. So since at this portion of the game, large tight night shards are relatively hard to come by, I'm only able to get my Eido to plus 6 before heading out. I don't want to waste time farming since it won't be long before I can just buy them, so I always just opt to move on with whatever I can get at this point. However, I'm definitely starting to see the downsides of the Eido. Not to say that it was a real hindrance, but these snake assholes take a lot longer to go down than I'm used to. Even with backstabs, they're just eating my sword swings like they're nothing. Again, nothing too terrible, but I can definitely see this becoming an annoyance later on. A bit further in, I decide to use another minor skip. See this guard here? The wall behind him is breakable, and the intended way to get past is to move the boulder trap so it goes down this way. However, if you can get up against the wall, the guard's stab attack will break it as well, saving yourself a trip if you want to collect the Hero Soul and Big Hat Logan. Of course, this asshole took nearly a full minute of sitting around and blocking before he actually stabbed me, but it was still a net time save. Moving on past the boulder and a few more traps and snakes, and we're just about at the next bonfire, and... Yeah. Three deaths at the same spot right before the bonfire. It's times like this that I wonder why I chose this Dark Souls Challenge series as my foray into YouTube masochism rather than something like backyard wrestling, eating Tide Pods, or lighting my taint on fire, because that might legitimately be less painful than this shit. In any case, time for the Metal Man. So remember how I talked about how the biggest issue for the Eido is enemies with high resistances who can't bleed? Well, this dickhead fits both categories perfectly. With double the slash resistance compared to Quilag and a total immunity to bleed, it was like I was hitting him with a fucking toothpick. And even more annoyingly, once I got the stagger off, I straight up didn't have enough DPS to get the knockdown. Not that it's particularly hard to kill him the normal way, but he can still fuck right off. Probably should have popped another resin here, but that'll be a lesson for future ads. On to Pretty City. Not too bad once you're familiar with it, though I did have a couple of gravity-related incidents. At least the raptors went smoothly, and the zappy demons left me alone for once. 
Of course, Silver Knights are a joke, so once I'm inside the building, it's smooth sailing. A quick pit stop to the giant blacksmith to bring Iaido to plus 10, and it's time to fix my earlier mistake and kill that asshole in gold. There's a reason I prefer to kick this guy off the ledge in Firelink, despite the fact that this path lets me steal Anastasia's clothes. That reason is that this fight fucking sucks. Regular human enemies are probably my least favorite enemy type in this game, and here you have to fight three of them all at once, including a goddamn caster. There were a few setbacks, but all it takes is circling around a pillar and praying that the RNG god sends Lawtrek in to attack you so you can just parry his ass to death. So Lawtrek's been taken care of, but I'll have to be better about remembering to take him out in Fire Link in the future. Time to fight Chris Chan and Sonichu. Now here's the thing about this fight. While Ornstein does have decent resistances, the player also power spikes a bit here since the giant blacksmith allows you to bring any standard weapon to plus 10 easily, where I'm usually only around plus 7 for the previous boss. So even though Ornstein has better resistances than Quilag, he's comparatively much squishier, and with the fast attack speed of the Eido, it's pretty easy to chip away at his health until Smo goes Super Saiyan. What's up? Ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, Boogie2988 coming at your levels again through the power of the internet. Phase 2 is even easier, as despite appearances, Smo has very low resistances and he's vulnerable to bleed, which is pretty much the best case scenario for this run in particular. And even though I didn't do it in this run, his AI is extremely easy to abuse, and you can get him to do his jumping attack roughly 90% of the time if you simply sprint towards him. So after an incredibly easy Phase 2, the dynamic duo is down and we finally have the boob vessel. Traveling back to Firelink, we give Anastasia her soul back to restore the bonfire to its rightful state. And even though I'm not ready to fight the Four Kings yet, it's time to head down to the City of Ghosts and Pain. Through the House of Horrors, drain the city, down the elevator, die horribly. Alright, take two. Back down and open the chest to find the very large ember. God fucking damn it. In any case, at this point I've got the chunks to bring the Iado to plus 13, but before I go farm the remaining few, I think it's time to take a trip back to the asylum. Torch Hollows make me want to unalive, but I get through them without issue. A drop through the breaky floor and it's time for Asylum Demon 2.0. This is exactly the type of fight where a katana weapon shines. Big and slow, allowing me to get multiple swings in at a time, low slash resistance meaning I deal a good amount of damage per swing, and very weak to bleed. So despite his considerable health pool, he goes down easier than most bosses up to this point. So now we've got a slab and with a bit of exploration, the peculiar doll, and rusted iron ring. With that out of the way, I think it's time to take care of the Darkroot Garden tasks. First up, Moonlight Butterfly. Like last time, I purposely waited till the late game for this asshole, meaning I'm OP as hell and easily one-cycle it. Next, Puppyzilla. After running past the gang squad, I quickly join the kitty guard to de-aggro them. Now it's time for the doggo herself. This fight is easy as ever. Note to future ads, make sure to cut that part out so the viewers don't think you're a fucking idiot. She's got pretty low resistances and health and has easily avoidable attacks, so that makes for an easy first try victory. This time I actually remember to take the anti-Gwyn ring from behind the tombstone, and we're done here. So now it's back to the giant blacksmith to spend my brand new souls on some green titanite shards, which I then used to turn that second Eido we picked up back in Blighttown into a divine Eido in preparation for the Nido fight later. From there, it's time to go down to Darkroot Basin to kill the Hydra. I actually managed not to fall in this time. Then a quick hit on the Golden Golem to set up for future DLC access. It's at this point that I realize I forgot to fully upgrade my Eido, so I pop 10 humanities and equip the Covetous Gold Serpent Ring and head down to kill some Dark Wraiths. Fortunately, since I'm already pretty damn close due to good luck earlier, it only takes one sweep through New Londo to get the chunks I need for plus 14, and the slab brings me to a sweet plus 15. Back to Pretty City and past the Painting Guardians for our next target. If you don't care about unlocking shortcuts and picking up drops, you can just ignore like three quarters of the painted world of Ariamis, so that's exactly what I do. Run around, kill the undead dragon, yes I know there's a skip here that you can do, but I still need to learn how to do it, which is a task for future ads. In any case, time for the hot furry. This girl is another example of the perfect type of fight where katana weapons shine. She's squishy as all hell and can bleed. So it's simply a matter of being a degenerate and looking at her feet to knock her out of invisibility and that's an easy one cycle. I'm sorry second best girl, but you are a boss so you have to die. In any case, it's time for some lord soul hunting. As per usual, I prefer to start with Seath so I can grab the firekeeper soul on the way. This will likely change in the future once I start implementing the duke skip into my runs, but for now there's no reason to let such a valuable resource just sit there. So after some absolute bullshit with the anger pigs, I grab the DLC key and take the single mandatory death of the run, giving up my ring of sacrifice in the process. From there is a quick and easy trip, a quick and easy trip to the bottom to grab the key and shut off the alarm. And then it's on to the archives proper. Fortunately, I make it past the channelers without issue, so after popping the shortcut, I grab the cell key and make a quick detour back to the jail to free Logan and grab the Firekeeper Soul, which Best Girl uses to upgrade my Estus Flask. Such a sweetheart. From there, I buy out Logan's stock. Is this a waste of souls? 
Absolutely. I'm not going to be using any of this shit. But I've never actually fully completed Logan's questline before, so I wanted to actually do it for once. Plus, I never ended up getting peak fashion souls back in the depths, so I'll need an alternative. But before that, let's quickly kill Seath. As per usual, I just brute force this shit. This fight really shouldn't be as easy as it is. Slashy slashy, and before long, he's down, and that's the first Lord Soul obtained. It's at this point that I realize I forgot something once again, so I head back to the Chamber of the Princess and chuck a firebomb at Tits McGee, and we now have Anor Gotham. I make my way out of the palace and kill the Dark Moon people waiting for me, including the Firekeeper, which would be a mistake, as I'd soon learn. So I head down to the basement and prepare to face off against the Holy Femboy. Unfortunately, I zigged when I should have zagged and ate a crossbow volley full on, which was a one hit. Now here's where I had a bit of a learning moment. See, the first time I had ever killed this boss, I entered via the Dark Moon Seance Ring, which keeps An Orlando golden, and when I died, as I often do when fighting a new boss, I respawned at the bonfire right outside. In future runs, I prefer not to have to go out of my way to grab the ring, so I simply killed Gwynvere for an easier route in, and this boss isn't exactly hard. So this run was the first time I died to this boss while the city was in spooky mode. What I didn't know was that when you die to the Holy Femboy in spooky mode, it forces your respawn at the Firekeeper's bonfire. Now, this isn't the biggest issue as you can simply warp back to the basement, but I killed the Keeper without knowing this. So the bonfire was gone, meaning I cannot rest at it and I cannot warp from it. And because I had already lowered the staircase to get to the basement in the first place, it was no longer accessible from the bridge. So I had to wake my way through the rafters again, use the lever to raise the staircase, and then crank it back down. What an incredible waste of time stemming from the fact that you get yeeted out of the basement in spooky mode. Jesus fucking Christ. In any case, when you're not acting like a dumbass, the fight is simple. Dodge the big zappy, hide from the little zappies, and zigzag around the pokies. He's squishy as all hell, so that was an easy two cycle. Now that that's all out of the way, I make my way back to the Duke's archives to finish off Logan's questline. Once you buy out his stock, he goes a little crazy and fucks off back to where you first die to Seath. You find him completely naked except for his hat, where he immediately attacks you. Though he acts like it, he's apparently canonically not hollow at this point. Just insane. Thought that was an interesting little lore tidbit. After killing him, I get the Tin Crystallization Catalyst, which isn't going to be used in this run. But more importantly... I got my hat. Now it's time to go through the unfinished amalgamation of lava bullshit. First up, Gonorrhea. Because this fight is poorly designed and has really fucky hitboxes, I opt to kill him in the lore accurate manner by baiting a jump at the entrance and smacking his hand. Moving on, I drop down the ledge to skip the Capra Demon clusterfuck and kill the worm to unlock the bonfire. And with that, it's time for Asylum Demon 3.0. This boss has the exact same traits I discussed with 2.0 earlier, mainly low resistances and no immunity to bleed. So despite the fact that he likes to explode, the Iaido makes short work of him. Time to suffer with Mr. Fantastic. Like I said in the last video, this fight is absolutely awful, though this time I opt to tank some lava damage in order to fight him on the bigger platform. At that point, once I successfully get him on dry land, I just brute force that shit. Moving on through unfinished Izalith, as per usual, I make a quick detour to grab the sunlight- a quick detour to grab the sunlight maggot, killing another not hollow, just insane person in the process. Then I get revenge on the Titanite dickhead. Time for the worst boss in the game. First limb is simple enough. Second limb, this happens. So for those of you who didn't watch the Lucerne episode, I'm playing on the Prepare to Die edition, which is capped at 30 FPS. I use mods to boost it up to 60, which is fine 99% of the time, but it does reduce the reach you get when jumping, so for certain sections I need to tap a hotkey to temporarily disable the boost. I was doing pretty good with that, but clearly I can't do a single run without fucking it up somewhere, so I fell to my death like a dumbass. Once I actually made the jump, the rest was easy. And fortunately, the final jump had no issues. Seriously, that's a fucking miracle because there's usually something that screws me up there. Though there was an obnoxious firestorm right as I reached the bug. Didn't kill me, but in such an enclosed space, it was completely unavoidable. In any case, the bedbug is dead, another Lord Soul is obtained, and it's back to Firelink and down into the Catagombs. I start out like normal until the first bonfire, but now it's time to implement the biggest skip of the run. After fucking up the Necromancer, of course. So if you stand right here, you can roll down to that ledge. Heal up, and you can move on to drop down over to another ledge. Drop down to a third ledge, and you'll be right at the end of the room with all the bone wheels. And that, my friends, is the Catacomb skip, and it saves a ton of time. Pinwheel is pinwheel. Need I say more? Maggot time. Like I said in my last video, I really should learn how to navigate this section without a light source so I don't have to waste time with the sunlight maggot, but that's a task for future ads. In any case, I have an unusually rough time getting through, taking a bunch of stupid deaths. But I make it through, being sure to have my Divine Iaido equipped, and go to fight Nido. 
As per usual, the hardest part of this fight is his minions, but since I have a divine weapon, they don't respawn, and despite being the literal god of death, Nito is an absolute pushover. Lord Soul number 3. With that, it's time to go back to the worst area in the game, but since I already did the most annoying bits earlier, it's a lengthy but relatively painless run to the abyss to fight the Ford Kings. Now, these guys can't bleed, which is unfortunate when using a katana, but their resistances aren't too crazy. But here's where I get to show you another neat little tidbit about the game. You could technically even call this a skip. See, one of Dark Souls' weird quirks is that you can still do damage to enemies while they're in their death animation. It'll still calculate and display it like normal, it's just that 99.9% .9 of the time that accomplishes nothing since the enemy is already dying. However, this can be abused during the Four Kings fight due to a quirk with how this fight goes. On the surface, the fight looks like a case of four enemies that you need to kill, and the health bar is simply the four individual health bars added together. But that's not how it works. Each king has an individual life bar, but the big boss bar is a shared health pool, which is an important distinction. This means that you don't need to do 100% damage to four individual kings, you simply have to do 400% damage collectively. So if you abuse the fact that they still take damage while in their death animation, if you have a weapon that deals enough damage, you can turn the four kings into the three kings. Awesome. This made the fight much easier and it also saved a moderate amount of time. Final Lord Soul obtained and the final boss is unlocked but we're not quite ready for that. We still have the DLC. Now, the DLC is known for having the best and hardest bosses in the game. Only one problem. Most of them don't bleed, which kinda concerned me. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. First up, Sanctuary Guardian. Since they forgot to give this guy a real health pool and it's easy to get hits in with a fast weapon like the Eido, I blow right through him. Now it's time to make my way through the Royal Woods, which is an easy but annoying run. If only there was some way to skip this section of the game. Make sure you don't miss the next episode. I'm going to show you something cool as hell. In any case, this time I do things the normal way, and it's time for a duel to the death with Artorius. Okay, more accurately, a duel to his death. Because come on, you're the protagonist. Doesn't matter how many times they kill you, you only have to kill them once and you win. Nighty boy down. After making my way through the city of darkness and bullshit, I unlock the elevator shortcut and grab the crest key before doing all the back and forth bullshit with Goff. Yes, I know I mispronounced his name in the last video. To unlock the Calamite fight. Heading back down to the clearing, it's time for the fight against Calamite himself. Yeah, himself. Not herself, like I mistakenly thought in the last video. Can you believe I misgendered Calamite during fucking Pride Month? In any case, despite his inability to bleed, which prolonged the fight, I was able to get through with only a few hiccups. Though to be honest, this is an amazing fight brought down by some really wonky hitboxes, particularly on his head. But despite that, I turned him into Calamint's meat. Time for the final boss of the DLC, Manus. As you may know by now, Manus is my favorite boss in the game, so I'm always happy to be here and even though I know you can cheese this fight with the hawk ring and feathered arrows, I find the fight itself way too much fun to do that. Hopefully I won't have to eat those words when I start doing bow episodes. So despite Manus not being able to bleed, he has surprisingly generous punishment windows, so it was easy enough to continually chip him down. As long as you watch your positioning and react appropriately to his different attacks, he's really not that bad. Bam. Manus is down and we only have one task left, the Human Torch. I make sure to equip the anti gwyn ring I picked up earlier and run past all the Black Knights at the killing of the First Flame. I was a little salty because I fucked up and died previously, but that was more than made up for by the fact that I had the single cleanest kill I've ever had on this guy. Didn't miss a single parry, blocked every fast swing, just fucking perfect. What a great way to end the run and that was Dark Souls with only the Eido. So that went about as I was expecting. The fast attack speed means this weapon was exceptionally easy to use, and since it only scales with a single stat, I had a lot of extra leeway to dump levels into vitality and endurance compared to Lucerne. While there were a few bosses that were a pain in the ass with high resistances and bleed immunity, I'd say the weapon held up pretty well from start to finish. I enjoyed that run quite a bit. Next up, Dark Souls with only the Black Knight Sword. So if you haven't watched the last video, I am in fact looking for some feedback to finalize the rule set for this challenge series. By the time you're watching this, I'll already have three episodes fully edited and ready to go, but I do have a few questions as far as the rest of the series. 1. Would you be okay if I used a bow in the following situations? To poke the Hellkite Drake and make it land faster, saving a bit of time. To finish off the head of the Hydra so I don't have to chase it down every time. And to safe spot phase 2 of the Bed of Chaos encounter. These would all be exceptions to my only X rule, but I feel that they do fit within the spirit of the challenge. But I want to know what you all think. 2. Can I use the firebomb skip for the Bed of Chaos? Again, it would be a violation of my established rule set, but since the Bed of Chaos isn't exactly an actual fight, I think it would be fine. Your call though. 3. Power Within. 
Under what circumstances can I use it because it is arguably overpowered? I don't want to ban it outright because there will be some runs where I think I'll really want to have it available, but I don't know if it should just be fair game no matter what. 4. When I do catalyst runs, can I use sorceries? Some catalysts are functional melee weapons, but some are not. I'm thinking I should allow sorceries for the weaker catalysts, but go bonk only for the ones that can actually deal real damage. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Big thank you to my patrons, especially my god tier supporters Bulk Squat Thrust, Drago, Fatima, and Michael Rotolo. If you'd like to join them to support me and get early access to future content on both my channels, consider checking out Patreon down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe because it really does help out, and check out the main channel if you're into video essays and weeb shit. Also, check out the supercut of all the boss kills from this run if you're into that. Follow me on Twitter at AdsTweets and join the Discord server if you want to chat. Well, with all that being said, thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Play the Electro Swing. Get the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Get the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. Watch your say. Get the road, Jack.